Hi, I'm Nathaniel Archer. And I'm Dan Sumption. And uh, we had the opportunity to interview Pete Nelson. Singer slash songwriter and entertainer. And he's been doing it for 60 years. He had some really interesting stories to tell, so it was great listening to him. Hi, my name is Pete Nelson. I've lived in Morecambe for 33 years, but um, I've been um, an entertainer for 60 years. So what influenced you to take up the guitar? It was a fellow called Dwayne Eddy, I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but um, he was like the first instrumental star really. He was American. He had a, he had a, a hit called Rebel Rouser. Um, and it was him because it was the sound of the guitar, you know. And a friend of mine who was a joiner said, I'll make you a guitar. <laughs> I thought, yeah. But he did. He, he said, if you learn to play it, I'll make it. Uh, and that's what set it off. And then I went and saw um, Cliff and the Shadows, or the Drifters, as they were called, then, in 1958. And they were British, obviously. So I thought, sure they can do it, we can do it. That's what started me off, really. I was 17 when I started playing, like, in a band. Uh, what was your first experience of playing in a band? Mainly youth clubs and stuff like that, which they don't really have now, but uh, they used to. Uh, but one of the first I did when I was 17, which is 1958, we went to this gig at Manchester and it was like six strippers and then us. Six strippers and then us. <laughs> so me, uh, being brought up very strictly, by my grandma and my, my mother, uh, my mother said, where have you been tonight? Manchester. I, I don't tell her that we'd work with strippers, or that would have been my show business because he finished. You know? uh, we did a bit of everything because we had a girl singer. Um, so we, we did a bit of everything, really. Um, mainly, you know, co covers of the day, yeah, really. But having a girl singer, we could do we could do other stuff as well. So uh, what was like the step between uh, working the youth clubs and then sort of uh, the next thing up from that, the working men's clubs? It was just a natural progression, really, that, that you did, you know. Um, youth clubs, you got you didn't get paid as much, and it was more of a, a dance thing. Uh, obviously, dance halls were as well, more of a dance thing. Uh, when you when you stepped up into working men's clubs, you had to have a bit more of an act, you know, a bit of talk between, a bit of comedy, maybe, you know, which you developed all of the time, really. Do you think there was a more pressure to entertain in that sort of a, a venue than the sort of the youth clubs yeah, that you were doing Yeah, 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 definitely. Because like I say, you could get you could get paid off, you know. <laughs> if you weren't going down well, you, you know. For the first spot and watch yeah, you. Yeah. And then you'd maybe do a, a, a dance spot where they'll have a dance yeah. on your second spot like because there'd be bingo as well in between. <laughs> and usually it worked like if you did if you went down well they'd book you back in maybe nine months time. So you were getting a, a, a gig every time you did a gig. If you were good, you got another gig. And so your diary was quite full, you know what I mean? Um, but I once saw a concert secretary book a ventriloquist talking to his dummy. <laughs> he came in the restroom and he said, you're a very good lad, we'll book you again. <laughs> that dummy, and he, you know what I did anyway. Yeah. He went, oh, thanks very much. So I understand that you went into performing at cabaret clubs and stuff, so how did that happen? They became um, like uh, the thing really, a step up from working men's clubs, it was more sophisticated, bigger names um, and you did a full week at a place like that rather than one night um, uh, yeah. and I think the thing that set them off was there was gambling, what would happen, you'd have the cabaret, a bit of a dance, blah 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 and it, usually upstairs or in another room there would be a big gambling room, roulette, poker, all that sort of stuff. Um, which helped to, you know, fuel the fire a little bit. Um, I can't remember the year when they did, they banned it, and it um, and it kind of killed those kind of clubs because through that they could buff the top names, which were I mean they weren't has beens at the time, they were top names at the time, you know. Dick Emery, there was Joe Brown, there was Tom Jones, there was uh, Eartha Kitt. Uh, because there was another club in Blackburn as well, it was called uh, the Starlight Club. At, at the time it was a, it was a cabaret club and you, you used to double with that. You used to do the first half at that club and then you shot over to Burnley or Briarfield to its sister club and you did the second half there. Um, and during that period, Dwayne Eddy was actually on, on, on one of those, but they had, on that one they had people like um, 
I'll read the old comedian, Max Wall, the old comedian. Uh, I'm just trying to think now. Uh, the New Seekers did the first ever gig in Blackburn for a week when the New Seekers took over from the old right. Seekers. We did a thing, oh, St. Helens it was, and they decided they were going to have this, this uh, a wrestling ring, um, a bout of wrestling, then us, another bout of wrestling, and Ken Dodd. <laughs> I was taught right, loads of different things that it just doesn't want today. You always dress for the part. People have come to see you, not to listen to you. They're not playing records. So you wear suits or whatever was smart at the time in fashion, etc, etc. And then regarding your act, you go on and first of all, you to what I would call, you have to build a bridge between you and the audience. You have to get their attention. When you walk on like that, you've got their attention. Once you've got the attention, it's up, you, up to you to hold it. And in, in those days, that's what you had to do. You had to build an act, you know. Yeah. So you start doing impressions and, you know, playing guitar behind your head. And, yeah. <laughs> I've done balls clubs in Morton when they were going, you know, Smokies, and oh. British Legion, and uh, all of them. Yeah. Do you remember a sort of standout gig in your time that was, you know, really one to remember? One that I'm particularly proud of myself is was at Peterborough, there was probably 2,000 people in the audience that, in that circus tent, you know. Um, and the power went. The mics were on, that's all. And, and I did like 50 minutes on my own with a guitar, just acoustic guitar, telling gags and silly songs and stuff like that. And they thought it was fantastic. But because I'd worked on the clubs, it gave me that experience and, and the material to fall back on, you know. Some, some of the funny stuff I was writing myself, but, you know, I mean, the reason I think I got that gig at Peter was because I always thought country music was a bit corny and a bit, you know, my dog died and my family. I started checking the Mickey out, you see, I thought, you know, everybody's checking this. All the British acts were trying to be cowboys, you know. <laughs> it was the gear and all that, I'm coming, you know, hello, I'm Johnny Cash and all this. And I just took the Mickey out of it a bit and it got me a lot of gigs, actually. And I ended up as a, ended up as a pure stand-up comic. Uh, see you wearing a Glen Campbell t-shirt, is there any? Interesting stories about him. So I went to Southport Theatre and uh, he introduced me to him. And it's probably the outstanding thing of, 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 of anything really because he's a three octave voice and he's the most fantastic guitar player I have ever met in my life. And he's never had a lesson. Wow. He was a sessions player in America. He played on loads and loads of records Frank Sinatra, Beach Boys. Jan and Dean, uh, loads and loads of stuff, and he couldn't read music, but he was that good that mm. it just, you know, he was he was a poor yeah. from Arkansas, and so he was one of my. I've got three, three people, and I think Elvis, Neil Diamond, and him. Um, anyway, and so he introduced, and I spent two hours with him, just me and him in the dressing room, no cameras, no tape recorders, just talking about everything. And it was absolutely fantastic treating me just like, you know, sat on the settee and he was, well, he was getting ready, we were talking about Elvis, about Beach Boys and guitars and, you know, fantastic, really, you know. Uh, I've been performing uh, for 60 years now and um, we, we're actually we're still performing, you know, doing the odd gig now and then. We're well, going back to Caldervale Club because uh, I've done it for years, even when it was the old club. <coughs> and. Um, he rang me up saying, yeah, I believe you've got a band back together, you know, so will you do a Saturday night for us? Because if I, if I put you on, it'll be a bit before, you know, so I thought, well, nice way to round off 60 years, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna leave old